In July 2009, drug dealer Anthony Cannon made his way to Bally Firma, believing he had an appointment with someone he trusted. At the time, the 26-year-old was a senior player in the gang led by boss Brian Ratigan and the chief suspect for a violent machete attack on the home of Ratigan's rival, gang boss Fat Freddy Thompson. Cannon's dangerous affiliations meant he was a target for multiple criminal groups. Known for his role in numerous gun attacks, including drive-by shootings targeting the homes of rivals' grandparents, Cannon lived under constant threat. Officially warned by the guard that his life was at risk, and while out on bail awaiting trial for assault, he donned a bulletproof vest as he approached the fateful meeting. Cannon was driving through Ballyferma on that fateful July afternoon when he spotted two men on a motorbike, one of them armed, approaching rapidly. Sensing imminent danger, Cannon abandoned his car and sprinted towards the nearby Longmeadows Park, desperate to escape. His heart pounding, he tried to leap over the railings, but a masked gunman closed in. With chilling precision, the gunman raised his weapon and fired. Eleven shots rang out, two striking Cannon in his head. As Cannon collapsed to the ground, the assassin continued to fire mercilessly. Blood pulled around Cannon as horrified onlookers, including children, watched in shock. One man dared to approach, turning Cannon on his side, only to see the gruesome extent of his injuries as the back of his head fell away. Cannon died instantly, his life brutally cut short. The gunman and his accomplice sped away on their motorbike, vanishing into the streets. It was the 17th gangland murder that year, leaving a community in fear and marking another violent chapter in the city's ongoing gang wars. Gardy quickly honed in on Keith Wilson as the prime suspect in Anthony Cannon's brutal murder. Keith and his brothers, Eric and John, would soon become notorious figures in Ireland's gangland underworld. Raised on Cremona Road in Ballyferma, the Wilson brothers were doted on by their mother Kathleen, but their childhood took a dark turn early on. Barely into their teenage years, the Wilson boys caught the attention of the authorities. John, the eldest, is believed to have groomed his younger siblings for a life of crime. But it wasn't long before Eric and Keith eclipsed him with their own ruthless exploits. Eric, Lucky Wilson in particular, carved out a reputation as one of Ireland's most prolific gangland killers, while Keith followed closely in his footsteps. The Wilson brothers' rise to infamy cast a long shadow over Ballyferma, a neighbourhood once marked by their innocence, but now haunted by their legacy of violence. When the orders to eliminate Anthony Cannon came, Eric Lucky Wilson was in Spain. Despite the distance, he orchestrated the hit, enlisting his younger brother Keith for the deadly task. In the tense minutes leading up to the shooting, Eric provided Keith with detailed instructions over the phone, ensuring nothing was left to chance. The hit was believed to be Keith's first murder, a dark milestone in his burgeoning criminal career, and unfortunately, it was not to be his last. Although Keith never faced charges for Cannon's murder, the violent act set him on an irreversible path of bloodshed and infamy. Just 13 months later, Keith would make the biggest mistake of his life, executing another gangster in Finglas. In August 2010, Daniel Gaynor, a volatile Rio IRA hitman, strolled along St. Helena's Road in Finglas with his girlfriend and two sons, blissfully unaware of the danger lurking nearby. Suddenly, the lone gunman emerged, firing in broad daylight. A bullet struck Gaynor in the neck, cutting short their journey to a family member's house and ending his life on the spot. Gardy quickly descended on the scene, discovering the murder weapon and a trove of incriminating evidence. Given Gaynor's violent history, investigators faced a labyrinth of potential motives and suspects, yet the killer's careless mistakes provided crucial leads. Gloves, a cap, a hoodie, and a Sturm Ruger SP-101 gun were all left behind. From these items, investigators were able to extract DNA, setting the stage for a probable breakthrough. Then three months later, on November 7th, 2010, the chief suspect was finally arrested, and it's none other than Keith Wilson. Known for his connection to the underworld, Wilson was hired to carry out the cold-blooded killing. However, his inexperience betrayed him as he left behind crucial evidence of the crime scene. In the aftermath, Wilson fled to Spain seeking refuge in a familiar haven where he and his brother Eric had often retreated. For a while, he managed to elude capture, but the peace was temporary. A few months later, a tip-off provided crucial evidence to the guard deep. Wilson was coming back to Dublin. In a meticulously planned operation involving dozens of armed detectives, he was arrested at Dublin Airport. However, Wilson refused to provide DNA samples, prompting Detective Com Fox to devise an alternative plan. 
Fox, one of the country's leading detectives until his passing in 2018, orchestrated a meticulous strategy to obtain Wilson's DNA. He ordered the yard where Wilson would stretch his legs to be thoroughly cleaned, photographed, and videoed before Wilson was allowed in. During the interrogation, which consisted of 10 separate interviews, Wilson was given an exercise break. Afterward, three Marlborough cigarette butts he discarded were collected and sent to the lab for analysis. Once examined, all three samples matched the DNA found on the gun, glove, cap, and hoodie. This marked one of the first instances where the guardee used the strategy of obtaining DNA from a suspect's discarded cigarette. During his exchanges with the guardee, Keith denied any involvement in the murder, claiming he worked for a removal company on Spain's Costa del Sol and had been there for four months. While in custody, Wilson received a warning from his brother John to keep his mouth shut. Wilson adhered to his advice, responding with a firm, no comment, when shown the items from the murder scene and informed that they matched his DNA. Additionally, he was presented with CCTV footage capturing him smoking a cigarette. Furthermore, he was informed that a toothbrush and towel that he had used while in custody would also undergo DNA examination. During questioning, Wilson was pressed about the notorious Ballyfermot veteran smuggler Sean Hunt, whom Gardy suspected of ordering the murder as retribution for killing a guy named Colm Collie Owen. Hunt, a criminal figure of immense influence, who passed away on Christmas Eve 2019, is considered a mentor to the Wilson brothers, personally training them to be cold-hearted killers. He had been in dispute with the Rio IRA faction based in North Dublin led by Alan Ryan, who himself was murdered in Clongriffin in 2012. The feud between Hunt and Ryan's Rio IRA spiralled out of control, and the situation worsened when the RIRA gang ordered the murder of Collie as he worked in an animal feed store in Finglas. Collie Owens was targeted because he was friendly with some members of the Ballyfermot mob, which included Sean Hunt, Major Criminal Mark Guinea Pig Desmond, and the Wilson brothers. It's believed that Hunt, who employed Owens, held Gaynor responsible for Owens' death. Infuriated by Owens' execution, the Ballyfermot mob decided Gaynor had to be executed and hired the Wilson brothers for the task. Keith arrived in Dublin from Malaga just five days before the murder, boarding flight E1585 at a cost of €250. Euros. He then returned to Spain on August 18th via a Ryanair flight, paying €88.47. Both flights were booked under the alias Nicholas Johnston, using a visa card. After his return to Spain, Keith quickly became the primary suspect, but maintained a low profile until his decision to return to Ireland. Upon his arrival, he was promptly arrested. When asked to provide a DNA sample, Keith adamantly refused, stating, not a chance. Despite his lack of cooperation with the Gardaí, the overwhelming evidence led to his conviction, resulting in a life sentence. Following his conviction, Keith also harbored a vow for revenge for the murder of his older brother John, who was fatally shot back in September 2012. The Wilson brothers were known as guns for hire within the Dublin underworld, with all three siblings involved in the trade. While Keith may not have wielded the same fearsome reputation as Eric, he had amassed nine prior convictions in the years leading up to Gaynor's murder, primarily for driving offences, but also for property damage, threats and abusive behaviour. Keith Wilson's life sentence coincided with his brother Eric's life sentence in Spain for the shocking murder of UK criminal Dan Smith in 2010. This meant that two of the Wilson brothers were now serving life sentences, while the third, John, had met a violent end. The Wilson family, including brothers Keith and Eric, cousin Alan, and nephew Luke, solidified their dark legacy as the country's first family of contract assassins. In the early hours of May 2005, a serene night in Ballyferma took a horrifying turn for 22-year-old Dubliner Martin Kenny and his girlfriend Sharon McDonough. Nestled in bed at Sharon's home, the couple's slumber was shattered around 5am by the sound of breaking glass echoing from downstairs. Heart pounding, Sharon jolted awake and urgently roused Martin, her voice trembling as she told him someone had broken in. The fear was palpable, but nothing could prepare them for what came next. Within moments, their bedroom door burst open, revealing a menacing figure clad in a balaclava and a bomber jacket. Shockingly, the intruder raised a gun and coldly opened fire on Martin. The 22-year-old bricklayer had no chance to react. He was killed instantly, his life brutally stolen in front of the woman he loved. Friends and family were left in shock, struggling to wrap their heads around the tragic event. Martin Kenny was never known as a troublemaker, However, he had once been best friends with Eric Lucky Wilson, 
a drug fueled psycho who had gone on to gain a notorious reputation as one of the most cold-blooded individuals to emerge from Dublin's gangland. Eric grew up in Ballyferma alongside his brothers John and Keith and their nephew Luke. Another cousin, Alan, was raised in the South Inner Sea. Over time, the Wilson clan became known as Ireland's first family of contract assassins, leaving a trail of more than a dozen bodies across Europe. Back in 2005, Martin Kenny and Eric Wilson had a falling out over missing drugs. At just 21, Eric shot his former best friend, being the first of the notorious Wilson clan to become involved in murder. Eric would go on to become Ireland's most prolific gangland killer, with at least nine more murders attributed to his name. Following the murder, Eric was forced to move to the countryside to escape the wrath of Kenny's relative, the notorious sadist, Mark the guinea pig Desmond. However, Eric soon discovered a grim talent for killing. In November 2006, when Eric was just 23, he gunned down Paul Ray from Drogheda on the orders of fingerless drug baron Marlo Highland. Ray had been caught with 180,000 euros worth of Highland's cocaine, and although he was charged with possession with intent to supply, Highland suspected him of being a guard or informant. Eric was ordered to kill Ray as he was being driven to court. By this stage, Eric was heavily using the drug himself. His fee for a hit was a kilo of cocaine, which he kept for his own personal use rather than selling it. Consumed by his addiction, Eric had become increasingly paranoid. His paranoia was evidenced when he was approached by another drug a drug dealer, Roy Coddington, who sought to purchase a weapon from him. Coddington, under threat from the INLA, had already handed over 30,000 euros in extortion money. However, the terror group demanded more and subjected him to a brutal beating when he couldn't meet their demands. By sheer chance, Coddington, who lived on the same street as Ray, had witnessed Eric gunning him down, prompting him to devise a plan for self-protection. Garda Intelligence suggested that he made contact with Eric sometime in March 2007, requesting to purchase a Glock. Police believed that Coddington did not threaten Wilson with exposure, but rather indicated that he had remained silent about witnessing the Ray murder. Wilson seemingly agreed, and a meeting was arranged for Mornington Beach. Around 4pm on March 22, 2007, Coddington drove his van near the beach and parked. Exiting his vehicle, he approached the blue Ford Focus, where Eric and an accomplice were waiting. The car then drove down the beach, halting near the sand dunes. It was there that Eric dragged Coddington from the vehicle into the dunes. With chilling precision, he produced a gun and fired at Coddington's chest. As his shocked victim lay bleeding on the sand, Eric leaned over and delivered two more fatal shots to his head. Swiftly, Eric and his accomplice fled back to their car and sped away. A German woman and her four children were only a few meters away on the other side of the dunes. The woman rushed to comfort Coddington in his final moments, but his injuries were grave, and he succumbed at the scene. Initially, the guardi were perplexed by the murder, assuming it to be linked to Coddington's past involvement in drug dealing. This belief was echoed by several of his criminal associates, who promptly went into hiding. Little did they know that it was the paranoid Eric Wilson who would then go on to carry out even more hits. Following the brutal slaying of Coddington, Eric fled to Spain, where he found refuge under the ominous shadow of Christy Kinahan, the godfather of Irish crime. In February 2008, Eric was summoned to carry out another ruthless execution, this time on behalf of the Kinahan cartel. His target? Paddy Doyle, a man whose greed had led him astray into the treacherous world of deceit and betrayal. The Kinahans held Doyle responsible, along with a British associate, for the disappearing of a staggering half a million euro of cartel cash. Later that summer, Eric used one of the many false passports in his possession to fly to Belfast and murder another drug trafficker, David Babyface Lindsay, and his associate Alan Napper, in his fifth contract slaying. Lindsay had been feuding with Mika the Panda Kelly, who lured him to the north on the pretense of paying him what he owed to settle their dispute. Instead, Kelly sent them to a house in rural County Down, where Eric was waiting, and the pair vanished without a trace. Eric Wilson's alleged affiliations read like a roster of Ireland's most notorious underworld figures, including the Northside crews once held by slain crime lords Martin Marlowe Highland and Eamon the Don Dunn, along with the infamous drug operation of Paul Berger Walsh. Among these dangerous circles, Eric's closest ties were with the late criminal mastermind, Sean the Smuggler Hunt. Hunt's illicit empire, who made millions with smuggling illegal cigarettes into Ireland, 
provided the backdrop for Eric's ominous ascent. It's rumoured that Hunt played a pivotal role in mentoring the Wilson brothers, grooming them not just as foot soldiers, but as lethal assassins capable of executing the darkest desires. In 2009, Eric is believed to have shot and killed drug addict turned hitman Christy Gilroy on behalf of Eamon Dunn, preempting any risk of Gilroy turning state's evidence if arrested. Previously, Gilroy had been recruited by David Babyface Lindsay to eliminate Anthony Foster, a close associate of Michael the Panda Kelly, during a period of intense conflict between Lindsay and Kelly. Around the same time, Eric was also the chief suspect in a disappearance and likely execution of a man named Dallin Campbell in southern Spain, further cementing his reputation as a ruthless enforcer in the underworld. Intelligence suggested that Eric buried his victims in lime-lined pits to accelerate their decomposition, a method he learned from Sean Hunt. Gardy investigating Eric attribute much of his cold-blooded behaviour to his heavy cocaine use. During the peak of his violent spree across Ireland, he demanded a kilo of cocaine, worth about 70,000 euros on the streets, as his fee for a hit. Ultimately, it was Wilson's rampant drug habit that led to his downfall, resulting in a very lengthy prison sentence. On the night of June 5, 2010, Eric was drinking at an expat bar in the coastal town of Mijas in southern Spain, when a confrontation erupted over a girl. She accused Eric of groping her leg and reported it to tall Dan Smith, a British criminal towering at six foot five inches. Smith, no stranger to violence, and wanted by Essex police after blowing off another man's fingers with a shotgun, ordered Eric to leave. Known for his violent temper, Eric stormed off, vowing revenge. He returned with a 9mm parabellum pistol and shot Smith seven times, including once through each of the Englishman's testicles. Unfortunately for Eric, dozens of people at the pub knew his name, leading to his eventual capture. He was tracked down and arrested at a rural ranch called Hacienda San Bargo, outside the inland village of Coin. Forewarned by the Gardi about who they were dealing with, Spanish police sent in the bomb squad to search the property. Inside the house, in a drawer in Wilson's bedside locker, they found aluminium electric detonators for plastic, military explosive simulators, and two manuals on how to use them. Fortunately, he never got the chance to use these deadly tools, as he was sentenced to 28 years in a Spanish prison for the killing of Smith. On July 26, 2010, the tranquil community of Fairview on Dublin's north side was shattered by a chilling incident. The Players' Lounge pub, a local establishment owned by the father of soccer star Anthony Stokes, John Stokes, turned into a scene of horror. At approximately 12.30 a.m., a lone assailant clad in dark clothing and a balaclava approached the pub wielding two guns. Without warning, he opened fire, targeting doorman Wayne Barrett with a shot to the head. Two bystanders, Austin Purcell and Brian Masterson, who were outside having a cigarette, were also hit in the chest and back, respectively. The gunman fled the scene in a red VW Golf, which was later discovered burned out in Dublin's south inner city. Miraculously, all three victims survived the attack. Remarkably, none of them had any ties to illegal activities. Years later, notorious cartel hitman Alan Wilson emerged as a suspect during a separate investigation into the Kinahan organised crime group. Wilson, implicated in the 2017 killing of Dublin criminal Gary Hanley, a target of the Kinahan cartel, became ensnared by law enforcement through a bug placed in his car. During recorded conversations, Wilson bragged to a friend that he was the gunman responsible for the player's land shooting. He later dismissed these claims as mere bravado, asserting he had not actually shot anyone and was trying to impress his friend. In 2021, Wilson stood trial for the attempted murders during the Fairview shooting. However, he ultimately pleaded guilty to the lesser charge of conspiring to carry out the murders, admitting to supplying the guns and getaway cars used in the attack. His plea was accepted, and he received a 10-year prison sentence. But Alan Wilson wasn't the only member of his notorious family to fall under suspicion for the Fairview shooting. In August 2011, a year after the incident, his cousin John Wilson was arrested. Although a file had been prepared and a decision on charges was imminent, John was ultimately released without charge. The Wilson family had a significant presence in Ireland's gangland scene. John, along with his brothers Keith and Eric, are well-known figures. Eric would later gain infamy as one of Ireland's most prolific gangland killers and is currently serving a life sentence in Spain for murder. Keith is also behind bars for murder. John was the first of the family to become involved in serious crime. 
At 24, he acted as the getaway driver in the 2001 drugs-related murder of Simon Doyle in West Dublin. Doyle was targeted in a shotgun attack, being hit at least twice in the driveway of his parents' home. In the years that followed, John Wilson aligned himself with criminal godfather Sean Hunt. In 2010, Hunt, an ex-IRA chief who had amassed millions through various illegal activities, including smuggling cigarettes, clashed with real IRA member Alan Ryan, who had begun extorting protection money from him. John was assigned to eliminate Alan Ryan, leading him to the Players Lounge pub in North Dublin. But instead of killing his target, John nearly killed three innocent people, a blunder that left Sean Hunt furious and led to John's estrangement from the group. John Wilson's life became increasingly perilous, especially after being discarded by Hunt. With his two younger brothers, Eric Lucky and Keith, both in prison for murder and no longer having Hunt's protection, John was left vulnerable and exposed. Nevertheless, John Wilson managed to survive three attempts on his life. In April 2011, he was shot in the knee during a late-night attack in his native Valley Firma. In September 2010, he narrowly escaped when two armed gunmen arrived at his house. It is believed that the would-be assassins, reportedly working for the Rio IRA, planned to shoot him as he took his children to school. Instead, they attempted to murder him at his home. However, when John's wife answered the door, the gunman panicked and fled the scene in a car later traced to the Tala area. Sixteen months earlier, in March 2009, John had another close call when he discovered a pipe bomb under his car parked outside his Bally firm at home. The Army Bomb Disposal Team was called and successfully defused the viable device. Through these incidents, it became clear to John that his life was in constant danger. Sean Hunt was furious and the extent of Wilson's failure in Fairview was made very clear to him. The feud between Hunt and Ryan's RIRA continued to spiral out of control. The situation worsened when the RIRA gang ordered the murder of Colin Collie Owens as he worked in an animal feed store in Finglas, North Dublin, just days later. In retaliation, Hunt ordered the murder of the alleged shooter, Daniel Gaynor, and enlisted Keith Wilson to carry it out, as he could no longer trust his older brother John. Keith fled to Spain, but was later extradited to Ireland and subsequently convicted of Gaynor's murder. After this, Hunt and the Rio IRA are believed to have patched up their differences, reportedly involving a monetary settlement. But meanwhile, with both his younger brothers behind bars, John Wilson was utterly alone. In September 2012, he was gunned down in the home he shared with his partner and children on Cloverhill Road in Cherry Orchard, West Dublin. It was around 1pm when John Wilson, having just collected his young daughter from school, pulled up outside his home. Accompanying them was another man seated in the front. John intended to drop his daughter at a neighbour's house for the afternoon, but first needed to retrieve something from inside. As he was about to step into the house, a car drew up behind him, and a hooded passenger, face covered with a scarf, emerged. The gunman followed John into the hallway through the open door. Suddenly, six sharp shots echoed. John was struck from behind, hit twice, once in the arm and once in the chest. The chest wound was severe, puncturing internal organs and leaving a six centimetre diameter hole. Still alive, John lay on the ground struggling to breathe. Twenty minutes later an ambulance arrived and John was already receiving CPR from several people. Despite continuous resuscitation efforts for over an hour, there was no change. Ultimately, the decision was made to cease efforts, as John had stopped breathing and had no pulse. Later, his little girl gave a heartbreaking statement, saying she heard bang, bang, bang and saw her dad rolling around. You see, John had a regular routine of taking his child to and from school daily. His attackers had stolen a brown VW Passat estate two days earlier in Selbridge County Kildare for their getaway. The car was later found burned out with the murder weapon, a Ruger gun, discovered inside. After the murder, the shooter went to JD Sports, bought new clothes, and dumped his runners, jeans, and two t-shirts in a skip. When the items were found in the JD bag and forensically examined, they contained firearms residue, petrol, and a phone. Just hours after the shooting, a suspect was apprehended, 36-year-old Keith O'Neill from Drimna. In court, he pleaded not guilty to the gang-related murder, but was nevertheless found guilty by a jury and sentenced to life in 2015. At the time, John was a member of one of Ireland's most notorious criminal families. At 35 years old, he was a father of two, a 
and had amassed a lengthy list of adversaries among criminal factions in Dublin, including the Rio IRA faction, led by Alan Ryan, who had been killed just a month prior. Suspicions arose regarding John's potential involvement in a planned shooting targeting Rio IRA sympathisers at the Players' Lounge in Fairview in 2010, suggesting a possible connection to his own murder. However, according to senior officers, Wilson had also become entangled in a dispute with drug traffickers from West Dublin in the months leading up to his death. John Wilson's killing marked the third gangland assassination in just five days and the 13th overall in 2012. Murder, assault and kidnapping. Irish criminal Alan Wilson has done it all. Nicknamed the Madman, he was part of the Kinahan cartel and once even threatened to shoot a baby during the Kinahan Hutch feud. In another sick tale, Wilson plotted to kill his former solicitor Kill Klein, prompting the emergency response unit to relocate Kill Klein to a safe house for protection. Shockingly, Wilson went to the extent of involving his own mother in this sinister scheme. But now the nephew of notorious gangster Martin the General Carhill fears his former associates and denies to have ever been a part of the cartel. He claims that Daniel Kinahan's gang has placed a 100,000 euro price on his head over his botched role in the failed hit on Hutch associate Gary Hanley. Wilson is currently serving a 10-year prison sentence for his involvement in a murder plot that resulted in the shooting of three innocent men outside the Players' Lounge pub in Fairview back in July 2010. In that case, the chain of events began unfolding when in 2019, evidence was stacked against Wilson as he was charged with conspiring to kill Dublin criminal Gary Hanley in 2017. Hanley was targeted by the Kinahan cartel due to his close association with the Hutch family. He had narrowly survived the previous attempt when he and Patsy Hutch, the brother of Jerry the Monk Hutch, were ambushed and shot at after being lured to a deceptive meeting in Ballymun. However, the 2017 Kinahan murder plot was foiled by Gardi. Wilson's every move and word was secretly being monitored as he plotted the hit with cousin Luke Wilson, Joseph Kelly, and top Kinahan cartel players, Liam Brannigan and Dean Howe. Wilson was recorded issuing instructions in regards to the destruction of the cars, as well as the method by which Handy was to be murdered. Armed officers intercepted a Volkswagen caddy van just 500 yards from Hanley's home on the night of the planned attack. Joseph Kelly and Luke Wilson were found with a loaded semi-automatic pistol as they were about to carry out the hit. Wilson was sentenced to six years imprisonment, backdated to November 2017, when he went into custody. His four associates were jailed too. Shortly after, given that six-year term, the DPP decided Wilson also needed to face charges related to the Players' Lounge gun attack. On July 26, 2010, the shooter exited a Volkswagen Golf parked near the pub, carrying two handguns. He opened fire at three men standing by the entrance, striking all of them multiple times. Two of the victims sustained permanent injuries, with one of them suffering severe brain damage. Remarkably, none of them were the intended targets. During the plot to kill Hanley, Wilson was heard boasting about his role in the Players' Lounge shooting. He told Joseph Kelly, I had done that job, when referring to the 2010 gun attack. Although there was other evidence used against him, his boast to Kelly didn't help his case. Wilson pleaded guilty to conspiracy to murder and to firearms offences. He confessed to procuring the firearms and vehicles used in the shooting, as well as providing crucial details about the escape route and the location to burn the getaway car. He claimed he was following the orders of a dissident Republican faction led by the late IRA member Sean the Smuggler Hunt. He was sentenced to 10 years for conspiracy, while charges of attempted murder of the three men were dropped. But this was not the first time Wilson was suspected of being involved in a gun attack on innocent people. Wilson was previously arrested and questioned about the murder of 22-year-old Darren Colgan, who was shot and fatally wounded in a pub in Injacore on June 25, 2011. Gardee believed the murder was a case of mistaken identity. The shooting happened an hour after two men entered the pub and began shouting, where are all the rats? They left the pub, but returned shortly after midnight and discharged a number of shots. 
Kogan was hit in the chest and did not survive the attack. The case still remains unsolved. Wilson was also tried for the murder of 18-year-old Mariora Rostas, who was kidnapped from Dublin city centre on January 6, 2008. The young Romanian woman had been begging on the street in Dublin city centre when her brother witnessed her getting into a car. He went over to ask what was going on, but was told by the driver they were just going to McDonald's for food and they would return later. However, a panicked call to another brother the next day confirmed fears that she had been kidnapped and held against her will. She said she was being sexually assaulted and could read some of the letters on a street sign from where she was being held. She was never heard from again. Until four years later in 2012, a protective witness brought Gardee to Kipur Forest in County Wicklow. There she was found buried in a shallow grave, wrapped in plastic and with four gun wounds in the head. Wilson was not the only suspect in the murder, but he pleaded not guilty. The case relied heavily on the evidence from a state witness, his former best pal, Fergus O'Hanlon, who painted a terrifying picture of Roster's last days. The trial judge told the jury O'Hanlon had received benefits, such as money and accommodation, from being in the witness protection program, and that it would be dangerous to convict on the basis of uncorroborated evidence. After a five-week-long trial in 2014, the jury found Wilson not guilty. However, at that time, Wilson was in prison for a meat cleaver attack, a fact that was supposedly unknown to the jury. A year and a half after Roster's disappearance, on June 3, 2009, Wilson and David Crowley broke into a house in Blanchardstown and attacked a man with a meat cleaver. Both men pleaded not guilty and the victim, David O'Brien, did not give evidence as he never made a statement to Gardee. The victim's former partner, Lisa Murray, and her father, Noel, were treated as hostile witnesses after both denied sworn statements in which they had identified the attackers. Wilson and Crowley were convicted in 2013. Wilson was sentenced to seven years in jail, and Crowley got an eight-year term. Four years later, Wilson won an appeal over the conviction on the grounds that the offence he was charged with was different from the one he was cautioned and questioned about. The Supreme Court directed there could be a retrial for Wilson, but the counsel for the DPP told the court there would be no retrial, as Wilson had, with remission, served most of his sentence. But Wilson couldn't long enjoy his freedom. He was arrested in November 2017 as part of the hit team hired by the Kinahan cartel to kill Gary Hanley. He was first incarcerated in Mount Joy Prison, but claimed to have been under major threat of his former Kinahan associates for the botched Hanley hit. He stated that the gang had a 20,000 euro bounty on his head for cutting or assaulting him and 100,000 euros for killing him. He was also believed to be furious that the cartel refused to pay him money while behind bars. At one point, Wilson was considered the most under threat inmate in the Irish prison system since he was jailed. In June 2019, Wilson was attacked by three other inmates and was left with a broken nose and cuts on both sides of his face. This incident led to him being transferred to Midlands Prison. In 2022, the paranoid gangster sued the Irish Prison Service for the 2019 attack, claiming that they failed to protect him against the Kinahan cartel. Recently, Wilson has been transferred again, this time to the high-security Port Leash Prison, after lashing out at jail staff. When a new group of staff were detailed to deal with Wilson, it caused the unstable criminal to launch an assault on officers. Apparently, he didn't recognize the officers guarding him. The feared thug hasn't served his time behind bars quietly. Following his arrest in 2017, he has been the subject of disciplinary sanctions on over 10 occasions, with the vast majority of these being for chilling threats to jail staff. On a crisp autumn evening, in an intricate park. 18-year-old Luke Wilson lay bleeding on the damp grass, his life seeping away with each laboured breath. Three bullet wounds marred his young body, one in the face, another in the neck, and a third in his arm. The acrid smell of gunpowder lingered in the air, mingling with the metallic scent of blood. As consciousness faded, Luke's mind raced. But death, it seemed, was not ready for Luke Wilson. Not yet. How did he end up at this park, laying on the ground, counting minutes to his death as blood seeped into the earth? Well, it was a betrayal by his best friend. The gunner was meant to change hands for another crime, but instead been turned on him. Patrick McCann, the friend he trusted, had pulled the trigger not once, not twice, 
but three times. McCann's main job that day was to end the life of Wilson as revenge for a row between the two where McCann had thrown insults at Wilson's uncles. It was only the fickle nature of fate or perhaps the poor maintenance of a cheap handgun that saved Luke's life. The weapon had jammed after the third shot. McCann's attempted murder would later get him 20 years in prison. Going back to Luke's story, with a strength born of desperation, he managed to grasp the mobile phone his would-be assassin dropped in haste. His trembling fingers dialed 999, and as sirens wailed in the distance, he dragged his broken body towards a footbridge, leaving a trail of blood in his wake, only to be discovered by a jogger. As paramedics rushed to the scene, no one could have predicted that this brush with death would merely be the opening chapter in Luke Wilson's criminal career. The years following the shooting were a crucible for Luke Wilson. The physical scars were evident, the loss of one eye, impaired vision in the other, and a constant tremor in his right arm. Little did anyone know that five years later, this same young man would eagerly volunteer for a high-stakes assassination plot. The target? A member of the rival Hutch gang. And the backers? None other than the notorious Kinnahan Cartel. As Luke recovered, Dublin's underworld was shifting. The hutch Kinnahan feud erupted, painting the city streets red with blood. By 2017, Luke Wilson was a man on a mission. At 22, he was still a small-time player, but his family name opened doors. His uncles cast long shadows in Dublin's criminal circles. Eric Lucky Wilson, rumoured to be one of Ireland's most prolific hitmen, now serving life in Spain for killing a British expat, and Keith Wilson, in prison for life for a 2010 murder of Daniel Gaynor, the dreaded Fingless gangland killer. Luke was consumed by the need to uphold the Wilson name, but it wasn't just family pride. The severe cocaine addiction and growing gambling debts put him in danger. With the pressure mounting, he knew he had to act fast to avoid becoming a cautionary tale. When Luke heard the Kinnahan faction wanted someone to take out Gary Hanley, a known Hutch associate, he jumped at the chance, despite his limitations, eager for the money and respect. Unbeknownst to him, the Garda's new strategy using advanced surveillance was tracking his every move. As Luke prepared for the Hanley job, he was unaware of the tightening surveillance. Detectives recorded his desperate conversations, gathering evidence and waiting to strike, ensuring he had no escape when he faced the judge. The day of reckoning approached, as he made his way through Dublin streets in possession of a loaded handgun with a silencer and three cans of petrol, his mind raced with a toxic mix of cocaine fueled confidence and desperate ambition. Just as he approached the location where he planned to carry out the hit on Gary Hanley, the trap was sprung. In a flurry of activity, armed authorities swarmed around him. The would-be assassin found himself staring down the barrels of several guns, his own weapon rendered useless before he could even reach for it. As the handcuffs clicked shut around his wrists, the gravity of his situation began to sink in. In the following months, as Luke awaited trial, the full extent of the Garda's operation came to light. The aggressive tactics employed by the National Drugs and Organised Crime Bureau had paid off, landing on one of their biggest scalps in the ongoing battle to stem the tide of murders that engulfed the capital in 2016 and 2017. When Luke faced the judge in the Special Criminal Court for Conspiracy to Murder, and firearm possession, his bravado was gone. The judge praised the operation and told Luke, had you thought this, you'd be facing 16 years. Consider yourself fortunate with 12. Luke gave a weak smile and murmured, thank you judge, before being led away to serve his sentence. While serving his time at Mountjoy Prison, prison officers observed him to be in particularly bad form. The weight of his actions and their consequences seemed to be pressing down on him, creating a powder keg of emotions ready to explode at the slightest provocation. That provocation came in the form of a simple instruction from a prison officer. It was late, and Wilson was spotted with a mop and bucket, apparently cleaning his cell. The officer, who knew Wilson well from his time on the landing, informed him it was too late for such activities. A reasonable request, one might think. But for Wilson, it was the spark they ignited his fury. Fuck off or I'll cut the throat of you, Wilson snarled at the officer, his words dripping with venom. But Wilson wasn't finished. As he was directed back to his cell, he continued his tirade, escalating his threats. I can't get you in here, he spat, but I can get you on the way home. I'll cut your throat. The menace in his voice was profound, turning a routine interaction into a chilling confrontation. 
A day wore on, and Wilson's behaviour only deteriorated. An incident with another officer led to the decision to move Wilson to a different cell. When three officers attempted to escort him, Wilson initially refused to comply. It was only when additional assistance was called that he finally cooperated. But even as he was being moved, Wilson's aggression reached new heights. In a moment of unbridled rage, he turned to the officer and uttered the words that would seal his fate. If I don't get you, I'll get your kids and family. I will cut their throats. For the targeted officer, these were not empty threats. He later reported that Wilson's words were delivered with real venom, a level of aggression he had never before witnessed from the young convict. The officer's concern was justified. He knew of Wilson's connections in the criminal world and believed him capable of following through on his threats. In court, Wilson's defense painted a picture of a troubled young man, deeply affected by his past traumas and struggles with addiction. His lawyer, Bowman, emphasized that Wilson's behavior was deeply rooted in drug use. Indeed, at the time of his arrest for the assassination plot, Wilson and an accomplice had been recorded snorting cocaine, a chilling proof to the depth of his substance abuse issues. Bowman portrayed his client as remorseful, a man who uttered words he desperately wished he could take back. It was a reaction over which he felt he had little control at the time, he told the court, seeking understanding for Wilson's outburst. The defense also highlighted the personal toll of Wilson's original 12-year sentence. Bowman described it as crushing for his client, who realized he would miss much of his young son's childhood. The judge presiding over the case at Dublin Circuit Criminal Court acknowledged the genuine remorse expressed in a letter penned by Wilson. Nonetheless, she couldn't overlook the severity and persistence of his threats. The threat was issued with significant venom and extended to his family members as well. The means by which the threat would be executed was set out, Judge Greeley noted, underscoring the specific and frightening nature of Wilson's words. The judge also emphasized the importance of protecting prison officers who perform a difficult and often dangerous job. Members of the prison service have to have confidence that something will be done, she stated, highlighting the need for consequences to such behavior. In her ruling, Judge Greeley sentenced Wilson to an additional three and a half years in prison to be served consecutively to his existing 12-year term. In a small act of leniency, she suspended the final 18 months of this new sentence, subject to strict conditions. That was it for today's video. What are your thoughts on today's topic? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel if you'd like to see our next videos.